since Donald Trump uh, became the president-elect last Tuesday, there has been a report of 310 hate crimes. That is a substantial increase. If we plot that out exponentially, that would mean that there will be in the next 12 months approximately 15,000 hate crimes. This information was reported by the Southern Poverty Law Center whose job it is to monitor hate crimes and hate groups across the country. Now, a couple of things have been reported. At Ohio University, a professor tweeted out pictures of white supremacist flyers found on campus, and the flyers read, why white women shouldn't date black men. They also published an article, we need to talk about online radicalization of young white men. That was a publication by TheGuardian.com. The FBI today released hate crime stats for 2015 and crimes against Muslims rose approximately 67%. There is an online petition that has over 250,000 signatures in a couple of days and that petition is for Stephen Bannon not to uh, be given or to be rescinded the job of the chief advisor to uh, Donald Trump. Now, Harry Reid's going to get on the floor and he's going to rail against Donald Trump and Stephen Bannon in particular. But afterwards, I have a question. Alan Dershowitz, who's a Jew, is going to come on uh, Steve Karnacki's show, and he is basically going to state that Stephen Bannon is not anti-Jewish. He's not an anti-Semite. Okay. He may or may not be an anti-Semite, but Breitbart is definitely a white supremacist, white nationalist blog publication. And he pres presided over it. And in my opinion, he still is pulling the strings on this thing. So if you lie down with dogs, you're going to get fleas. That's just a realism. Here's Harry Reid's speech on the Senate floor. There he is. Let's take a listen. Makeup do we have there in the infrastructure? Is it a trillion dollars? Two trillion? Some say three trillion dollars. It's really in bad need of help and repair. It's an automatic job creator. Each time we try to do something over these decades on infrastructure, Republicans obstruct it. So if we can finally get Republicans to make the job creating infrastructure investments we've been seeking for years, that will be a welcome development for the Senate and the country. If Trump wants to pursue policies that will help working people, Democrats will take a pragmatic approach. Democrats have a responsibility to improve the life of Americans, all lives. But we also have other responsibilities. We have responsibility to be the voice of millions of Americans sitting at home, afraid that they're not, that they're not welcome anymore in Donald Trump's America. We have a responsibility to prevent Trump's bullying, aggressive behavior from becoming normalized in the eyes of America. 
especially the millions of young people who are watching and wondering, for example, if sexual assault is, sexual assault is now a laughing matter. What responsibility say that is not normal for the KKK, Ku Klux Klan, to celebrate the election of the president they view as their champion with the victory parade? They have one scheduled. And I, yeah, that victory parade is scheduled in North Carolina, by the way. words we have responsibility to lead. Outside this Senate chamber, you can hear hammering. We have workers that are hammering on the platform for the inauguration ceremony. It'll take several months to do it, but it'll be done right. In 65 days, Donald Trump will step onto that platform. For four years, he will yield the loudest and most powerful microphone in the world. But even as those workers hand away on Trump's platform, and even as we as leaders accept the results of this election, we must also give voice to those who are afraid. Because there are many that are afraid. Indeed, a majority of Americans oppose, oppose Donald Trump. Many of my Republican colleagues in this chamber oppose Trump. And they weren't alone. Trump will be the first president to take office, having lost a popular vote by 2 million. Every day for the past week, a majority of American voters have awakened to a difficult reality. Not only did that man who lost the popular vote win the election, but his election sparked a rise in hate crimes, threats of violence. <clears throat> Since election day, the Southern Poverty Law Centers reported hundreds of incidents of harassment and intimidation. Last count, 315 from their calculations. Overwhelmingly, the hateful acts of anti Muslim, anti Hispanic, anti African American, anti woman, anti LGBT, anti Semitic, and anti Asian. I've heard these stories from friends and family. My, my and my wife's Nevada physician is a Pakistani American of Muslim faith. We think so much of him. We know him each other for 35 years. The day after the election, my friend was in a restaurant in Las Vegas having dinner. A man in approaching him in a threatening manner said, where are you from? I said, where are you from? The man that approached him said, I'm welcome. The doctor said, so am I. That same night in another restaurant in Las Vegas, a Pakistani physician was having dinner. A man walked up in the same manner. said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Pakistan. He said, why don't you go back? <clears throat> One of my staffers has a daughter in middle school. I've known that little girl since she was a little baby. The day after the election, the principal addressed the entire student body on the school's PA system because the two incidents had occurred that he wanted to talk to them about. In one instance, a boy yelled at a Latina student, telling her that he was glad she was going to be deported now that Trump was president. In another instance, a boy was sent home for yelling the most derogatory, hateful term at an African-American student. The boy justified himself by saying he used that language now that Trump was president. In Spokane, Washington, the Martin Luther King Center there was defaced with the same hateful word. Those are only a few examples of what people close to me have related. But these kinds of disturbing accounts have been heard across America. I have here, Mr. President, a compilation of these uh, incidents. Comes from NBC News. Another is from another publication. Hundreds of incidents in the last few days. I would ask that be made part of the record. That 
that was just entered into the record. Those references made are awful, are hateful, they're frightening, they're scary. I invite any of my colleagues to read these horrible acts. And I invite any senator, Democrat or Republican, to come right down to this floor today and uh, defend any one of them. These examples of hate and prejudice. I don't believe anyone in this chamber wants to defend the hateful acts that are being committed in President like Trump's name. They lead to one unavoidable conclusion. Many of our fellow Americans believe that Trump's election validates the kind of bullying, aggressive behavior Trump modeled on a daily basis. How can we teach our children that bragging about sexual assault is abhorrent if we rush into the arms of a man who dismisses, dismisses this locker room talk? If we fail to hold Trump accountable, we all bear a major responsibility for normalizing his behavior. Here's a letter from a seventh grader from Orion. Sure, at the day after the election, I have a direct quote from the letter. Seventh grader. I'm extremely scared, especially being a woman of color, that the president of the country that I was born and live in is making me feel unsafe when I actually shouldn't feel unsafe. It's even scary because this man who is now the president of the United States of America has said such rude, ignorant, and disrespectful things about women and all different types of people is now in charge of our country. I want to feel safe in my country, but I no longer can feel safe with someone like Donald Trump leading the country. Close quote, end of letter. Our president is supposed to make people feel safe. But on Wednesday, a seventh grade girl woke feeling frightened to be a woman of color in America because Donald Trump was president elect. If we ignore her voice and other voices, this seventh grader we left to conclude that we as a nation find her fear acceptable. How do we show her that she doesn't have to be afraid? The first step is facing reality. No matter how hard the rest of us work, the main responsibility lies within the man who inspired the fear. President Trump must act immediately to make America, like that seventh grade girl, feel that they are welcome in his America. Healing the wounds he inflicted will take more than words. Talk is cheap and tweets are cheaper. Healing the wounds is going to take action. But so far, Mr. President, rather than healing these wounds, Trump's actions have deepened them. And it's one of his very first, if not his official, first official act. He appointed a man seen as a champion of white supremacy as a number one strategist in the White House. Number one everybody else under him. According to CNN, and I quote, white nationalist leaders are praising Donald Trump's decision to name Stephen Bannon as his chief strategist, close quote. In the same article, white nationalist leaders say they see Bannon, quote, as an advocate for policies they favor, close quote. And according to the Poverty Law Center, Bannon, quote, was a main driver between Bart becoming a white ethno-nationalist propaganda man. Close quote. When asked to comment on Bannon's hiring, KK leader David Duke told CNN, again, quote, I think that's excellent. Close quote. A court filing stated that Bannon said, again, another quote, that he doesn't like Jews and that he doesn't like the way they raise their kids to be whiny brats and that he didn't want his girls to go to school with Jews, close quote. That's a court document. By placing a champion of white supremacists a step away from the Oval Office, what message does Trump send to the young girl who woke up Wednesday morning in Rhode Island afraid to be a woman of color in America? It's not a message of healing. If Trump is serious about seeking unity, the first thing he should do is rescind his appointment to Steve Bannon. Rescind it. Don't do it. Think about this. Don't do it. As long as a champion of racial division is a step away from the Oval Office, it will be impossible to take Trump's efforts to heal the nation seriously. So I say to Donald Trump, take responsibility. Rise to the dignity of the office of the President of the United States. 
instead of hiding behind your Twitter account and show America that racism, bullying, and bigotry have no place in the White House or in America. <clears throat> I yield the floor, Mr. President. Under the previous order, there will be some time. Okay, that was Harry Reid. He is the outgoing Senate Democratic leader. Again, Harry Reid did not seek re-election this year. He will be retiring in January, but there he was. The day after Donald Trump was elected president last week, Harry Reid issued a blistering attack on Donald Trump in this speech. You just heard there on the Senate floor Harry Reid saying he sees it as his party's, as the Democratic Party's duty to be the voice of people who are scared by the election of Donald Trump and who he, who he says are scared by the developments since Donald Trump's election, Reid citing a number of examples there uh, of hate crimes, of alleged hate crimes that have occurred over the last week that have been documented uh, across the country. And then uh, just at the end there of his remarks, you heard him going specifically after Stephen Bannon, Bannon, uh, who Donald Trump has announced will be one of his top White House advisors, his top White House advisor, in fact, uh, Dershowitz saying that, that he had made, uh, Bannon had made the Breitbart news site a haven uh, for hate groups under his leadership and urging uh, that uh, Trump rescind the appointment. He said, just don't do it. Those are the words of Harry Reid right there on the Senate floor. For more now, let's bring in prominent civil liberties lawyer Alan Dershowitz. He actually now, Alan Dershowitz is a Jew, okay? And this is my question. Are the Jews playing both sides against the middle? Because you have the ADL, the anti the anti defamation league, condemning, condemning the appointment of Steve Bannon uh, as the chief uh, advisor to uh, Donald Trump, and specifically, you know, I'm going to give you that quote. Give me a second. I need to, I need to bring it up. Um, okay, here we go. The ADL statement reads, and I'm not going to read the whole statement, just the portion that uh, refers to uh, Bannon. In the second paragraph, and this was issued November 13, 2016. At the same time, ADL strongly opposes the appointment of Steve Bannon as senior advisor and chief strategist in the White House. It is a sad day when a man who presided over the premier website of the alternate right, a loose-knit group of white nationalists and unabashed anti-Semitists and racists, is slated to be a senior staff member in the People's House said Jonathan A. Greenblatt, ADL CEO. We call on President-elect Trump to appoint and nominate Americans committed to the well-being of all our country's people and who exemplify the values of pluralism and tolerance that makes our country great. Okay, that's the ADL, which is a high-powered uh, Jewish organization. Now note, they specifically didn't call Steve Bannon anti-Semitic or really anything else. What they said was that he has presided over the premier website of white nationalists and anti-Semitics anti -Semitics and racists, okay? So he ran the shop for all these guys. Why do you run a shop for all these guys if that doesn't reflect your ideology is my question. And it damn sure ain't gonna be about money. Now, I'm gonna play the Dershowitz piece and he's basically gonna jump in and defend this guy and he's an attorney. You gotta watch these attorneys because they are professional spinners. And apparently this Jew has made a decision that he's going to spin for Bannon. Here we go. He gave an interview to the site Breitbart today saying that he doesn't believe, based on the evidence he's seen, that Bannon is an anti-Semite. So uh, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. Let me ask you about this because what sure. we've been hearing, I, I've been hearing a, a bunch of 
labels flying around since this ban appointment was announced. And this obviously has a lot of people in those remarks there. Harry Reid saying, look, there are court filings that say that Stephen Bannon said he doesn't want his kids around Jews, around Jewish kids. You're saying you don't see evidence he's an anti-Semite. What, what is it that you're seeing? Well, first of all, a court filing. It was the testimony of his former wife. Of course it's in a court paper, but he disputed it and contradicted it and said it never happened. He just from what I've heard, wanted to send his kids to a Catholic school, and that was a point of division between him and his former wife. Look, I don't know whether he's an anti-Semite or not. I just don't think you should toss that phrase around casually unless there's overwhelming evidence. There's an enormous difference between three things. One, is he personally an anti-Semite? I've no, heard no evidence to support that. He has hired Joel Pollack, who worked with him for four years, who's an Orthodox Jew, who wears a kippah, who's married to, uh, uh, has a mixed race marriage. Um, he uh, has been very positive toward Jews and toward uh, Israel. So that's number one. I think the evidence that he's an anti-Semite is just not there. Number two is, has his paper become the actual vehicle for a bigotry? And number three is, is he supported by bigots? Let's turn to number three first. Yes, he is. But to show you an analogy, if Keith Ellison, who's a decent, good person, were to be appointed the head of the Democratic National Committee, Hamas would support it, would cheer and yell, because he has had some association with Farrakhan in the past. He's made some statements about maybe that 9-11 was something. It should be clear, though, in the, in the case of Keith yeah. Ellison, you're talking about now, this is Congressman from Minnesota right. who's trying good, to the Good person. But he also, the, the Farrakhan stuff you're talking about was he participated in the Million Man March, helped no, organize that organize in, yeah. in, in 95, right. and he said, once he found out a sort of a full history of, of Farrakhan's statements, he said he considers an anti-Semitic Mike doesn't want anything no, to do with once it. Once he decided to run for Congress, of course he knew, everybody knew that Farrakhan was an anti-Semite. Could... See, okay, see, now he, he's spinning there because, you know, everybody didn't know that uh, Louis Farrakhan at one point uh, was uh, an uh, anti-Semite. Now, Farrakhan has walked a whole lot of that back over the years, okay? And uh, he has even met with uh, various Jewish uh, leaders, okay, to, quote-unquote, if you will, bury the hatchet. So uh, for what Farrakhan did, you know, back then, which was approximately 20 years ago, he's trying to draw an analogy to what Steve B uh, Bannon is doing right now. That's not going to fly. If you want to use that analogy, then why don't we need to go back and say that uh, Donald Trump is a fucking racist based on the discrimination uh, that... Uh, he did against black people uh, in uh, not allowing them to rent his apartments. If you're going to make an, go back in time and make an analogy, then it's equally plausible to go back in time to make it another analogy against your guy. Okay, and we can even go further back uh, where certain of his patrons in his casino didn't want black people around him, and uh, Donald Trump basically acceded to their wishes. And he was sued uh, in a New Jersey uh, court because of his discrimination against black people uh, in, the, his, in their place of employment. And that's a public record. So if you want, you want to mix apples and oranges or you want to mix apples and apples, you know, there we go. Listen to two minutes without hearing him rail against the Jewish people. I'm making an analogy only on the point of you can't always judge a person by the supporters. What we're seeing in this country is a very dangerous development on both sides. We're seeing the Republicans move alt-right, we're seeing the Democrats move hard left. And I have to tell you, the only thing the hard left and the hard right have in common, they hate Jews, they generally hate Israel, they generally hate America, and I think we as centrist but Americans you're not, have to be very concerned you're not about putting this movement. It, right you're not now. putting Ellison in, in that category. When you say hate Jews, you're not putting Keith no, Ellison no, in I'm that. saying many of his supporters hate Jews. Many of the people who would applaud his nomination. I would say the same thing about Al Sharpton. He's a decent guy. I know him. But he is supported and applauded by many people. Talk about unsafe spaces, as Harry Reid talked about. Harry Reid, who's, I know him very well, he's a good guy, I like him, should go to college campuses and see how unsafe college campuses are for people on the right, for Christians, for Jews who support Israel. You know, we have to understand this is a phenomenon that applies both to the hard right and the hard left. 
and we shouldn't apply double standards. But I am not a fan of Bannon. I am not a supporter of Breitbart. I just want to make sure that we don't throw around the term anti-Semite too loosely and that we apply the same a, standards to both sides. Is, is there something more specific and more particular to what's been created at Breitbart? Because the, the Anti-Defamation League, for instance, came out and they condemned this appointment. And again, it wasn't so much, the statement that they put out wasn't so much saying Bannon is an anti-Semite. It was saying that the site has become a haven for anti-Semites. And you've got David Duke out there, you know, you had Harry Reid just citing that saying. But he never published an article. This is. The, the article that was published, for example, that they quote extensively, where he talked about Crystal as a renegade Jew, that was written by David Horowitz, another Jew who called him a renegade Jew. Yes, they published it. But I think it's important to look. Okay, so he said, yes, they published it. He controls everything that comes out of there. And see, that's, that's the thing that most of these guys in power do. They always have scapegoats, okay? They always have somebody else that can take the blame. Look at Chris Christie in Bridgegate. All of his hirelings, okay, they're the ones that are going to jail. But, you know, they kept their mouth shut, and Chris Christie basically looks like he's walking away from this thing. That's what happens when you have a person in power. Okay, same situation with Bannon. He didn't have to write a single article, but he probably has reviewed the majority of the articles that uh, are written and come out of Breitbart, or he knows his personnel, and he knows that they're going to write stuff that he likes. Okay, but anything that comes out of there, he's, he is responsible for. So for you to say that uh, that article wasn't written by Bannon, you're absolutely correct about that, but he reviewed it and gave it the thumbs up. So, you know, that's bullshit what you're talking here. At what they've published, and there are things that they've published which I fundamentally disagree with, but there are things published on the hard left that I fundamentally disagree. So I think, we, again, three standards. Number one, what do they publish? Number two, is he an anti-Semite? Number three, who are his supporters? And we have to distinguish all of those elements and then condemn only where condemnation is just This is the thing that's tough to measure, and let me ask you about this, though, because I've heard from, you start talking about, it gets a dangerous road here, but when you start talking about comment sections in Twitter, there has been a noticeable uptick, and a lot of reporters have talked about this this year, of anti-Semitic commentary in Twitter feeds, in terms of responses to reporters, comments directed at reporters, in comment sections on a place but like Breitbart. you know Breitbart. where most of it comes from? Most of the anti-Semitic tweets come from the hard left. I know. I publish about every month an article in the Boston... That's bullshit. You can't possibly know that most of the tweets come from the hard left. You could say most of the tweets that you receive come from the hard left, but there's no way that you could say most of the, the uh, uh, tweets that are anti-Semitic come from the hard left. Listen to what the guy says, okay? He's making generalizations that just aren't true and he can't back them up with facts. The Globe, you should read the comments that follow it. Hard left anti-Semites, anti-Zionists, go after me for everything in the world. So yes, Twitter is terrible in the sense that it publishes all of these commentaries, but go and see but where I, they're coming I guess from. I, I, I mean, from both from, sides. I've from more than one reporter who's Jewish. You say, I've been reporting for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years. I've never received the kind of feedback, the kind of anti-Semitic feedback that I have once I started covering the Trump campaign. Is there something that's been stirred up? Whether I'm not saying maybe yes. it was by Trump himself, maybe it was by Breitbart. Is there something that's yes. been stirred up that's new There's here? no question that new, what's new is the anti-Semitism from the right has become emboldened and it's now kind of almost catching up with the anti-Semitism on the hard left. Which he cannot make that statement. He is, that is idle conjecture, and anybody with half a brain would know it. That's conjecture. He cannot know that. If he knows that, he needs to come out with specific numbers, okay, across the board, not just uh, uh, against his own particular periodicals or blogs. He needs to have numbers that are supported basically by uh, the various social media outlets. Otherwise, he's just making up bullshit. It's been in existence for 20 years now, sometimes disguising itself as anti-Zionism. Uh, take, for example, Black Lives Matter. I love the concept of Black Lives Matter, but they have become an anti-Semitic group by putting in their program that Israel and only Israel is a genocidal apartheid country. That's bullshit. He threw the word only. They said that Israel 
is an apartheid and a genocidal uh, country. That is absolutely fucking true, okay? Israel has a policy of sterilization of black people in their country. And that also is documented. When uh, black women, African primarily, uh, go to uh, obtain any type of uh, Planned Parenthood uh, services or whatever, Israel has a policy of issuing them medication that is known to sterilize people. They don't issue that medication to their own citizens, but they issue it to African women, okay? And the overall effect of it is sterilization. So he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. Anti-Semitic. I will have nothing to do with the organization Black Lives Matter while continuing to support their programs and their policies. So I think we have to focus on the extremism of right and left. That doesn't justify Bannon or Breitbart, and I understand, I agree with much of what Harry Reid said, and I think it would be a good thing if the president reconsidered that appointment, but I want to be very careful about calling him an anti-Semite unless there's more evidence. If there is, I will join the chorus, but not without more evidence that I've currently seen. Okay, okay so let's sw switch it around. Let's just call him a supporter of anti-Semitism. Let's call him a supporter of racism. Let's call him a, a supporter of misogyny, okay? So we're not calling him one, we're calling him a supporter of those particular things. If that makes you any happier, Mr. Dershowitz, you piece of shit.